Uh, my name is Brad Williams, and uh, many of you have probably seen me throughout uh, the last two days uh, in my role as the team lead for the Nuclear Energy University programs. Uh, right now I'm switching gears, uh, double-headed with uh, program manager responsibilities for a new program that uh, we're just starting uh, actually with this webinar, um, really getting things going on uh, transient testing R&D. This year we're soliciting an IRP uh, on the order of $3 million over three years uh, for some specific uh, transient test instrumentation development, and I will go into that in the next few slides. So first we'll start off with what is transient testing. Uh, reactor safety covers a wide range of scenarios um, on, you know, very, very short timelines to very, very long. Transient testing is the evaluation of the reactor system's response to specific accident uh, scenarios. Since these events cannot be simulated in a typical uh, test reactor uh, without damaging the said reactor, we need to come up with a different mechanism for conducting these necessary uh, tests. The information produced from transient testing uh, impacts all phases of fuel development and reactor system development, all the way through uh, development, all the way through light qualification and licensing. As you've heard uh, yesterday, uh, there's significant efforts going on here at the Department of Energy on developing new and advanced uh, nuclear fuels, both for light water reactors and for uh, advanced reactors and uh, transmutation systems. This slide, uh, which I borrowed from the, uh, the fuels program and the fuel presentation in FC2, uh, gives you a highlight of the major activities going on in our fuel development campaign. Uh, you see advanced light water re reactor fuels with enhanced performance, safety, and reduced waste generation. So what we're looking at here are new fuels uh, that could be used in uh, current reactors or the next generation of light water reactors. Uh, and these fuels could have higher burn-ups um, and more recently we've been emphasizing uh, reduced uh, or, or improved performance under accident scenarios, uh, what we've coined accident tolerant fuel. Uh, and that is a key uh, aspect that will be uh, factored into the needs for transient testing. Another main component is, uh, is the transmutation fuel, the metallic trans transmutation fuel development activities that we have underway under a closed uh, reprocessing fuel cycle uh, for use with advanced reactors. Both of these fuel types would, throughout the development and qualification, would require transient testing. So as we go forward, keep uh, the different fuel concepts for both accident tolerant fuel and transmutation fuel in mind. You'll see on the green box here that they specifically call out the need for transient testing infrastructure and this work scope, this IRP, is specifically focused to address that. The NEMS program, which is our Nuclear Energy Advanced Model Modeling and Simulation uh, Program, has a direct connection to fuel development as they are developing uh, fuel performance codes and I will touch uh, on those a little bit later. I mentioned that uh, transient testing, um, evaluating performance under accident scenarios is a required step in licensing and I know I'm sure it's hard for you to read on your screens um, but this is a, uh, a map of what we call technology readiness levels, TRL levels, and it gives you an idea from, uh, from the initial concept all the way through development and demonstration of where you are and what's required. And you'll see here that you can't pass TRL level six without transient testing. So what that means simply is you can't fully qualify a fuel without transient testing. But in reality, we should actually begin doing uh, accident testing much earlier to help us uh, at an early stage down select and uh, um, develop new tests for spe specific options that we want to develop further. 
Historically, uh, the fuel testing approach has been focused on uh, single pin failure testing, um, looking at various different, uh, different things, uh, loss of coolable geometry and uh, pressure wave generation, uh, fuel rod failure, among other things. Uh, but, but really looking at things at a, a fuel rod level instead of at a, um, a core has been the way that we've done things. Uh, with the advances of modeling and simulation, we hope to provide data, fundamental um, separate effects data and integrated data that can be used to uh, do an evaluation of a much larger um, sample or, or the full core. Um, the second bullet just highlights some of the specific uh, experiments that have focus, been focused on this development, uh, fuel pin failure, uh, temperature geometry changes, um, and how they impact the fuel and the fuel cladding and the interactions, um, mechanical energy generation, and uh, radiological release, so fission gas release is something else that's of direct interest. This slide uh, shows some of the things that happen. You know, it, it says at the beginning, uh, the fuel element is quite simple. You just have a, a fresh fuel pin, fuel rod. Uh, but during irradiation, a lot of things happen. And it happens very quickly and early on in the process, and we want to understand that. And the, the uh, diagrams give you a couple examples of some of the things that, uh, that we're looking at. Fracture, fission gas release, uh, among other things stress corrosion cracking. When you have an accident, the situation gets much more complicated. And you can see some uh, examples of what happens to the fuel in different accident testing scenarios. These are the types of things that we'll specifically be interested in once we begin transient testing. And I should mention, um, I should have mentioned it at the beginning, uh, we do, currently do not have a tra transient testing capability uh, the Department of Energy is uh, moving forward uh, in hopes of resuming a, uh, a testing capability. Uh, they're going through, through that program right now. Uh, we do not at this date have a uh, selected option for how, what we would do, the specific reactor we would use for transient testing. Um, so everything that we're initially developing should be able to apply to multiple options that are being evaluated. Um, and, and I have a link on the last slide that will provide additional details to that side of the program and the different options that are being uh, considered. Um, this uh, this R&D program is separate but linked, but it focuses specifically on developing the instrumentation that would ultimately be used uh, once a testing capability is back up and running. So just please keep that in mind as, uh, as you're completing applications and developing ideas. If a decision is made uh, prior to the uh, due date for applications, we will uh, provide additional information, uh, make a modification to the, to the FOA as necessary to provide further uh, clarification if and when that happens. So historically, uh, one of the main things that we're interested in for transient testing is being able to see, you know, I showed you the pictures of what happens to the fuel after, after it goes through the transient. But really, we want to know what's happening to the fuel while it's in the middle of that transient. You, know, you can do, do the uh, post-transient uh, examinations, but we want to see what's actually happening in real time. Historically, this was originally done uh, with a high-speed uh, camera video device. And you can see a diagram here that was used where they just placed a high-speed camera outside of the reactor. There was a direct line of sight into the, uh, the core and the fuel sample. Um, in order for this to work, the, uh, the, cat fuel cat, the test capsule had to, be, uh, had to be clear so you could see through it and see what was happening. Uh, and they were able to take some very impressive pictures and, and get some, some good data with this method. Um, but that was, that was many, many years ago when this was, was the optimal case. And since then, 
uh, the technologies have improved and, and new capabilities have been, uh, been utilized. What we want to do here is take it even further to the next generation um, capability for line of sight monitoring in real time. I mentioned that the next iteration uh, historically was to the use of a hotoscope. Uh, and this allowed you to still see the fuel motion and behavior um, during the transients in real time, but you can now see it through opaque test vehicles. Uh, this allowed us to, uh, to get more data um, and, and do different types of tests. So this was this was the next step and is currently the, the state of the art. Uh, this slide shows an example of the Cabri, Cabri reactor in France, uh, their hotoscope and, and some of the information they're able to obtain. Uh, they can do online monitoring. They can also do radiography and tomography with, that, with uh, their capabilities there for examining some of uh, the post-transient um, information. So I mentioned uh, future experiments, what we're looking for, what the purpose of this IRP is. At the end of the day, once uh, we have things moving forward, we'll need a full suite of uh, test capabilities, starting with separate effects testing and uh, moving all the way through to fully integrated uh, systems and, and multiple loops. Uh, in the reactor to really simulate what's happening in a, uh, in a commercial reactor. Uh, and the diagram again just shows you some of the different things moving all the way forward. I mentioned at the beginning a uh, connection between the fuels R&D program where they are developing the new fuel concepts and conducting the R&D, obtaining the specific uh, data that's necessary. Um, but there's a direct link to the modeling. And uh, this slide here shows the fuel product, fuels product line under NEMS, the uh, Moose Bison Marmot Code. And uh, you can see the details, but uh, each of these are, are unique codes, but they work together to give you a complete picture of the fuel and, and enable you to do a, a very accurate and successful modeling of different fuel concepts. Um, this program is currently underway under NEMS. You, you will hear later about the specific uh, NEMS R&D needs to help further develop this capability. Uh, additionally, we created this year Appendix D to the, to the FOA, which uh, identifies data needs for validation for both the NEMS program and the CASEL uh, Energy Innovation Hub, which is focused on simulating uh, light water reactors. Uh, in that appendix, they identified specific things that uh, an R&D project, data that the R&D project may develop uh, that could be useful to the, the modeling program. So under this, this is another potential area for good connect collaboration. We're developing instrumentation. That inf instrumentation might, might uh, obtain data that would ultimately benefit the modeling codes. Uh, so, so that is definitely a connection that is relevant to this IRP. Some of the specific uh, areas that, that we're interested in right now for technical development are listed on this slide. Again, the, the main focus is on the, uh, the fuel motion monitoring, the line of sight monitoring in real time. Uh, but we're also interested in, uh, in obtaining other types of data. So state of the art or uh, our new um, instrumentation that would work specifically under transient conditions. Um, and remember, these are very high energy, sh very, very short time uh, pulses. So we would look for instrumentation that specifically works in those types of transient environments. Uh, more general instrumentation would be covered under the NEAT Advanced Sensors and Instrumentation Program. Um, but there may be something there that could be modified and, and apply to meet some of these needs uh, listed here. And the third bullet, as I men mentioned, is uh, a need to connect and integrate with the modeling and simulation programs. 
And with that, I will stop. Uh, this slide shows some contact information. Um, again, you can contact me or Dan Watts, who is uh, my technical counterpart, and I promise you he knows uh, way more than I do as he's been working on in this area for quite a long time, um, whereas I'm, I'm getting started with it over the last few months. But contact either of us if you have questions, and, and we, will, uh, we will address them. I also list uh, Frank Goldner and John Carmack, who are the fuels campaign managers. Uh, they're the ones leading the actual fuel R&D development that, would, uh, that we would be supporting with transient testing. So if you have specific fuel questions, you can contact them. And I mentioned uh, more information on the actual activities to resume transient testing. This link provides you uh, with additional detail on those options and the current status. Uh, with that, I will take questions. There's just one question. What time scale are you interested in by transient testing? That's, thank you. I, sh I should have mentioned that. Um, the immediate time scale is uh, we're looking at uh, 2018 and the driver for the, to have testing, uh, at least initial testing, up and running. And the driver is the, uh, the Accident Tolerant Fuels Program, which was, uh, is on a 10-year 10 um, 10 demonstration cycle schedule uh, that was initiated a few years ago and, and in 2011 we started to we had two IRPs related to those fuel concepts that have been moving forward as well as some industry activities on, on concepts but that's the driving factor and the goal was in 10 years demonstrate a lead test rod uh, of an accident tolerant fuel so in order to support that we need to uh, be up and running in about 2018 The, and I should add, we don't have to have, ideally we'd like to have all of the, you know, the selected reactor fully instrumented, instrumented by 2018, but that's, you know, we may begin with some simpler tests and then add the capabilities as we develop them. So it's not a requirement to have them exactly at that point. I assume the transient tests with advanced instrumentation is to be at ATR or some similar operating reactor. No, um, it would not be at ATR. As I mentioned, you know, one of the problems is you're going through such a high energy uh, event that it, it, it could damage a test reactor if you tried to conduct something there. So uh, what you see on this slide, we're, we're trying, there are a couple of options, uh, treat, at the Idaho National Lab uh, was historically the reactor that we conducted the transient testing. Uh, but ACRR at Sandia is another option that could meet our needs. Uh, they're going through the process of um, determining which option. Uh, obviously, there's also a, no, do, you know, a, a do not move forward and, and do nothing option. Uh, but they're currently evaluating all of those uh, different things. Um, but it would, it would not be an ATR or a current test or commercial reactor.